I know, 16 years. Even when I checked the release date, I had to double take. Over a decade and a half since this masterpiece came out. Very seldom does a game really last this long, hold up for so many years to come, and is still played by a dedicated fan base and an even larger viewer base on YouTube. So it can't just be nostalgia. The rose tinted spectacles that many hide behind, not wanting to come to the sad realization that their favorite game from their childhood isn't actually that great. Trust me, I had a very similar experience with Ben 10 Protector of Earth. I feel you. But there has to be something more to it. There has to be a reason Rome Total War stood the test of time and has gone down in history as one of the greatest PC games of all time. Even now, 16 years later. I am releasing my Heavy Rock single Plead on the 25th of September. Make sure you click the link in the description to pre-save or play now. But let's start back, even further back than 2004, four years before in fact. 13th of June 2000, when a small company called Creative Assembly released a game much like no other before. Shogun Total War. Shogun wasn't really like the Total War games that we know and love now. It was 2D, basic, but it had the bone works. A CA hadn't really done all that much before except help EA with a few sports titles. This was a big risk. The RTS genre was ruled by the likes of Command and Conquer and Age of Empires, and this was a different taste. Shogun almost created a new flavour, a new type of RTS game, going to focus more on historical authenticity than anything, taking the chess style gameplay and putting it into real historical settings. A rock, paper, scissors mechanic, sword beats spear, spear beats cavalry, cavalry beats archer, and archer beats sword. This basic mechanic has continued to be expanded upon and detailed in further games in the franchise. Shogun Total War was fairly well received, but there was some way to go. Then Medieval was released on the 19th of August 2002, a follow on from the success of Shogun, taking what that did and putting it into the 12th century and into the first ever 3D style battlefield. Okay, it isn't truly 3D, it's very much in between the 2D style of Shogun and what we're about to see later on, but with its expanded focus on historical accuracy once again, Medieval Total War was widely acclaimed for its innovative gameplay and ideas. But despite all its success, the Total War franchise wasn't that mainstream powerhouse that we know today. It took one more game, one more addition, to smash it into a wider audience and put itself up with the RTS Kings, and that game was Rome Total War. Whilst Rome was the third game in the Total War franchise, it was the first to take up that world of true 3D graphics. Upon its release, it came under mass praise. People that had picked up Shogun were blown away with this new take on the infancy of the franchise, and newcomers to the Total War games had a jumping off point that would make them fall in love with CA and their future endeavours. I for one had my first experience with Rome Total War when my brother bought me the game on CD-ROM for Christmas when I was about 9 or 10, and I was instantly addicted. Rome Total War became one of the best selling games of 2004 and was widely talked of as one of the best games of all time by critics and fans alike. I think it's safe to say that the title still stands in the eyes of many PC gamers as this legendary edition. Standing at a 92 score on Metacritic, it is the best rated Total War game of all time and I have a feeling that it will stay at the top in the future of new games in the franchise. Of course, Rome Total War had multiplayer. It almost paved the way for Rome Total War content on YouTube, with the likes of Prince of Macedon and Heir of Carthage going head to head with other players on the strategies and multiplayer mode. And it's great, but the multiplayer has never really been the focus of the Total War games. It's like garlic bread. It doesn't take much time to consume and is somewhat satisfying, yet rarely can hold its own individually. It needs a big beefy lasagna to get some real long term sustenance from it. And boy, is Rome's campaign beefy. When you first pick up the game you have the choice of playing one of three Roman families. Julii, the Scipii, and of course the OG, big boys that you should always play as, the Brutii. That feeling when the Greek militia have Roman generals smash into their rear. 
This is a message from the Brutii gang. Now, in terms of actual research and units, all these Roman families are fairly similar, but the big differences are the starting positions on the map. The Julii focusing more on repelling the inevitable invasion from the Gallic armies. The Scipii they must take to Sicily and the city of Syracuse whilst watching out for the looming Carthaginians. And finally, the Brutii who must travel across the seas to the Greek borders. Starting with nothing but a few cities and a couple armies, players must expand, researching barracks, stable and ranges for new troops, mills, government houses and blacksmiths to keep the cogs of war turning. Whilst trading is important, the game really does focus more around the military side than expanding Rome as a whole, deciding how your vision of the empire will turn out. There's something just satisfying at seeing your small village grow and become this military powerhouse or an economic keystone. It doesn't really matter how many times you play the game, it's always different, and it's so exciting unlocking the next level of unit, the auxiliar archer or the legionary cohort, and of course, for the small child in all of us, units like onigas, war dogs, and flaming pigs. Everything within your faction can be buffed or boosted with religion, using different temples to improve population happiness, economic advantages, or to gain military prowess. And I think Rome Total War has one of my favourite progression systems in any game ever. Not only in the units and buildings, but also the overall faction system. When playing through any of the Roman campaigns, you can expand and invade other cultures. Once all the provinces or cities of a culture have been taken, then they are officially destroyed, with any straggling army is turning into rebels, but because of this victory you're now able to play as that faction in your next campaign playthrough. No annoying experience levels, no wait times and definitely no microtransactions to unlock different cultures. Just plain old pure bloodshed. Almost saying, I have now destroyed you, now I own you and can take control. You know, the regular chill time in the resident household. Now, if I'm going to be completely honest with you, I don't think there has been a campaign since Rome that has given me the same in-depth addiction. Now, don't get me wrong, I do love Rome 2 and its campaign. It's great, and it's really fun to play as, and I still play it to this day perhaps more than Rome 1's. I think Three Kingdoms is also the most mechanically advanced Total War, and its single player feels really in-depth and efficient, but Rome 1 had me playing for hours and hours at a time. Even when I wasn't playing the campaign, you can be sure that I was thinking about playing the campaign. The next move, the next unit that I wanted, the next faction that I needed to be destroyed. The combination of leaders and generals with their own portraits and personalities alongside these armies walking around the map, the game somehow brought emotion to them. Now, hear me out. Every time you see the Gallic troops moving into your lands, you know what those sly bastards want. You would send your troops to guard passes and stop their advances. Or you could see an enemy fleet coming towards your own transport and it ends up killing half your forces and the anger and the lust for revenge. Creative Assembly somehow made a total war that has emotional effects on a player. They made pixels and AI create feelings of anger, joy, revenge and victory within anyone that played that game. Think about it, when was the last time that happened? It's one thing creating an engaging and emotional story with a linear set out game, but within a sandbox, or even an RTS for that matter, that takes something else. But for me, it wasn't the campaign that made Rome Total War stand above all other strategies at the time. You see, something was needed, something to bridge that gap between RTS and grand strategies, and that came with battles. Total War's winning recipe. It goes without saying, the effect that these real-time battles had on not just the RTS gaming, but PC gaming as a whole, was massive, changing the face of how people played games even to this day, and bringing battles the sizes and scales we've never seen before, inspiring games like Imperial Glory and King Arthur. Once coming face to face with another army on the world map, you'd zoom in in some sort of ancient CSI to expand and enhance, moving into the sight of rolling fields, scorched sands, damp forests or even towering walls. Generals will give a roaring speech, motivating soldiers and allies for the long, brutal slog that was ahead, then going on to spitting insults at the armies that lay beyond the mist, using deployment times to set up the perfect formation. It may be practical or it may just look good. Either way, you can bet that I'm spending 15 minutes getting it perfect, skirmishes in the front, heavy swords forming the front lines, but they're not alone. Reserves standing poised behind with their peeler to chuck over the heads of their brothers as they clash onto the onslaught of barbarian hordes. 
Their wings guarded by heavy spears and stronger shock units, used offensively to keep flanks safe or, in more aggressive opportunities, taken round to envelop the enemies caught up in a blood fest with my legionaries. Long range archers would take aim, peppering charging fanatics with arrows and stones, whilst guarded by the lighter hand to hand units that I kept at the back, just in case of those opportunistic enemies or sneaky cavalry. Speaking of cavalry, far out on the borders, my light and heavy horse charged round the opposing lines, searching for any units left out of formation. Archers, slingers, skirmishers, even straggling infantry, they are all in danger now. And finally, the general himself, mounted on heavy saddles, ushering inspiring words to the men, eyeing down that traitorous leader that lies on the other side of the field and ready to give any shock support if needed. Let the decimation commence. There's nothing quite like it, zooming in and seeing the individual battles, realising that although they're just pixels on a screen, they represent something much more harrowing. Real soldiers, real lives, sent to war because of the greed of a man on a golden throne, and in this case, you. You're the dictator. Defending each other's backs or coming to a sticky end as a rogue spear thrust takes them off balance to a hopeless struggle in the dirt. Don't even get me started on sieges though. As a young boy, if I wasn't already blown away by the game that can have thousands of troops on the battlefield at the same time, the siege battles took it to the next level. It was the first time that I had seen actual buildings and walls fall down in a game. Troops carrying ladders up to the towering fortifications, watching up close to the climb with their little low res shields above their heads and arrows pouring down. Every now and then one of them getting hit and tumbling to their demise. Siege towers being pushed up, men on either side of this hunk of wood getting into place whilst deadly level 3 towers really give them a run for their money. Jesus Christ, those things were tough. I mean, I get they're firing some sort of nuke from the arrow slits, but this could take down Godzilla. I mean, this seems to be a trend in the Total War franchise, having these defending towers with these massive, almost bomb ballistas that come out of them. I mean, even in Three Kingdoms, you've kind of got to avoid these or capture them as soon as possible, or you're going to be coming to a very unsavory end. But, but I jest. Fighting on the walls has to be one of my favourite parts of the game. Watching the attackers, one by one, jump up from the ladders, or the tower drawbridge come crashing down and outpour bloodthirsty opposers. The tug of war once on top of those walls. One side pushes, the other loses ground. The other side gains reinforcements and the balanced bar of men heads the other way. Someone slips, fighting on the edge of the unprotected wall and down they fall onto the paved streets. It's a sad but somewhat amusing death. But the dynamic options are what put Total War games above all other games, and I do believe that Rome started this in a big way. Having the decision to make, should I use battering rams, sappers to destroy the walls, ladders for a quick but vulnerable assault, or just sit back, let my onigas do the dirty work from afar? How many titles give you that choice? I could talk for hours about the battles in this game and even then not do them justice. The scale, the aesthetic, but most importantly, for the attention to detail. Talk about the sheer love and passion that went into Rome on would be a 20 page long essay, but 16 years later I still believe it has to be the most detailed Total War game to date. And here's why. Generals have specific traits, not only to have effects on the campaign map, but also in battles. If they're an outstanding speaker, the opening address to your troops, they'll speak eloquently, with passion and heart. Every part of the world map is translated exactly into the battle maps. For example, upgrading a town with a new barrack will then be rendered when you fight in that town. Blocking a river or a bridge? Well, it's time for a choke point battle. Even if a battle is happening on the coast and some random fleet is sailing past on the world map, going into that real-time battle you can see those exact bows on the horizon. The world map and the game battles are exactly the same. This is something that newer Total War seem to have failed to do completely, or at least in the same way. Disbanding troops on the world map grows the population of the closest city as the men go back and settle into their daily lives. This works vice versa, recruiting more men from a certain city or province will lower the population massively. Buildings mid-construction on the overworld map will also show up as construction sites when you go into view in the battle map or go into a fight in that town. Each speech given at the start of the battle will talk about you, your army, the enemy you're fighting specifically, and if there's been any past fights or history with you and your opponents, your general will refer to them. In sieges, every building could be destroyed by flaming projectiles. Any that had been during the battle would then need to be repaired on the campaign map after the fight. When charging the enemy spears or shields, cavalry and their horses would try and jump over the front line. Why did this never come back? 
Elephants would go berserk, but they could be put down by a swift chisel to the skull. A settlement's distance to its capital would have big effects on the mood of its population and growth. If a city is newly captured and you haven't replaced all the other culture's buildings yet, the different styles would be shown up within that settlement on the battle view. There could be natural disasters throughout the game, and these would be shown up with animations on the world map, such as volcanoes or earthquakes. And these are just a few of the exact attention to details that the developers put into the game. Most of these never really came back in future editions to the franchise. And I'm not sure it's ever been explained exactly as to why. Why could something be done in 2004, but not now in 2020? We saw some things make a return, like the population mechanics in Three Kingdoms, but there's still so many bits of attention to detail that got lost in the expansion of the franchise. And that's somewhat sad to see. Sad to see where it's all gone. Rome Total Wars based games sold, well, let's just say, well. And because of this, Creative Assembly wanted to explore more around the similar type of era, expanding elsewhere with new cultures and features in the game. And this is where the expansions come in. Let's start with The Good One. Barbarian Invasion, released on September the 25th, 2005, just over a year after the base game. Barbarian Invasion takes place several centuries after Rome Total War that we knew before. Instead of Rome being at its peak, it's coming to the downfall. The Huns and Goths are on the horizon, ready to start pushing through the east to the empire that once was. The expansion added the new horde mechanic. Most barbarian factions are given the opportunity to lose the privilege of cities and provinces for a life of travel, pillaging, and continuous war. These hordes are sometimes started from the beginning of the campaign, moving in from the northeast, or they can be created simply by destroying the last settlement of a barbarian faction. Hordes do have the opportunity to settle once taking back a city, or just choose to carry on with sacking settlements, causing mass damage to the culture in control of said province. The expansion also introduced religion on a bigger scale. Instead of the base game where there was just a few temples to give buffs, now the players and cultures could choose to introduce religion and gradually convert other cultures to their beliefs. And it was decent. Barbarian Invasion was pretty well received. It didn't add all that much to the Rome Total War repertoire, but it gave a different playstyle. A campaign with hordes was very much different to one without. Also, playing as the Western Roman Empire was almost a new hardcore mode added in, starting with revolts, terrible economy, and military threats from the get-go. It wasn't really for the faint of hearted. Then, in June 2006, came the second expansion pack for Rome Total War, Alexander. The pack puts players in the role of Julius Caesar in his invasion of Gaul and the barbarian island of England. Oh, wait, no, sorry. It, oh, no, oh, okay. It puts you in the role of Alexander the Great. Okay, that makes more sense. Putting on his shoes and naming way too many cities after yourself. I mean, the expansion was passable. I, I think, personally, I didn't play it too much because of the disinterest in the very linear approach to the campaign. I mean, unlike Barbarian Invasion that added in numerous factions with different play styles, Alexander added in, well, <laughs> Alexander. Yeah, that's it. One campaign, one option, one play style. The player's Macedon. I mean, that's absolutely fine if you love Alexander, but for everyone else, what's really the point? It doesn't do anything for you. Also, the weight being put on one main character like good old Alex here means if he dies during a historical battle, well, I guess you're starting again. In BI or the base game, you could make attachments and get to know your generals. Their traits made them unique to themselves, and if they died, it was sad. But you had to push through and hope they had an heir or at least someone just as competent to take their place. It wasn't bad at any stretch when they introduced Alexander, and there was still something to get your teeth into. Just after the great BI and the base game, it didn't really feel like Rome Total War. Rome Total War was a game of grand scale, from a company and franchise that, at the time, weren't all that well known. And this is why I think it's important to keep tributing and talking about a game like this. It has changed the way so many games are made today, and not just in the Total War franchise, but across all of the PC market. Everything it had going for it, all the success and awe it brought players, it was never really replicated in the same way. Even in following additions to the same series, 
they never really captured the feeling of loading up this game with the soundtrack, the iconic sounds and speeches throughout, the population and progression systems, even the persistent and dynamic world map were never done in the same way. I mean, do people still even know how to make games like this? <sighs> Some may say that it's nostalgia glasses, but even playing this game to get footage for this video, it took me back. It made me shocked just to how much detail that they put into a strategy of this caliber, and it seems like this art has been lost. But the game is not. It's still there, if not a bit crashy at times, but it's still available to go and play whenever you desire, to relive your times of conquering the dastardly Gallic tribes, holding streets with your heavy pikes, or running rings around peasants with Parthian horse archers. And even if you don't have a PC, or just think you're not going to get around to playing it, I can't recommend many a true nerds let's play series on both the base game and Barbarian Invasion enough. It's one of the, if not the best gaming let's play series on YouTube, and he really shows off this classic with its true colours and prowess. Whether or not we're going to get anything like this in the future, or games such as these are just a thing of the past, I don't know. But it has been something of a trip down memory lane, looking back at Rome Total War, 16 years later. Uh -huh.